Hey Cool Worlds, it's David. So today I want to talk about one of the most interesting types of planetary systems out there, a circumbinary planet. So first off, what is that? The word circumbinary here simply means that something is orbiting two stars, a binary star system. So imagine that we have two stars orbiting reasonably close to each other and then a planet going around on the outside orbiting both of them. That's a circumbinary planet. Now this idea might seem like an exotic concoction. After all, it's very different to the solar system where we have just a single star in the center. And perhaps that's why science fiction writers and movie producers have long toyed with the idea of circumbinary planets, perhaps most famously with Tatooine in one of my favorite films, Star Wars A New Hope. But actually, the idea is not as fantastical as it might seem. If we just leave aside the issue of planets for the moment, we certainly know that binary star systems are very common. As shown here, about 40% of sun-like or G-type stars have binary companions. Indeed, the nearest sun-like star to us, Alpha Centauri A, lives in a binary, or even really a trinary system. And not only are binary stars very common, but planets around those binary stars are also very common. A statistical study by Armstrong et al. in 2014 using the Kepler data showed that there are at least as many planets around these binary stars as there are around the single stars. So that means that Tatooine is not this rare, unusual, exotic thing. It's at least as common as we are. Despite this, circumbinary planets definitely give astronomers some headaches. If we have just a single body, be it a planet or a star, orbiting another body, the orbit precisely follows Johannes Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and that's because you can analytically solve for the orbital path just by using Newton's laws of gravity. So the orbit is like clockwork, perfectly predictable and stable, and we like that as physicists. But introduce a third body into the mix and the mathematics explodes. Things get very complicated very fast in this so-called three-body problem. Now, many of the intellectual giants in celestial mechanics, such as Euler, Lagrange, Jacobi, and Hill, have tried in vain to search for clean, simple solutions to the three-body problem. Yet, none could be found. So this is kind of embarrassing for physicists, right? Because we can't even predict the motion of particles in a universe that is filled with just three point-like particles. That's it. We can't solve that problem. To try and finally resolve this, in 1885, King Oscar II from Sweden issued a prize of 2,500 kroner to anyone who could solve this frustrating problem. A few years later, Henri Poincaré won the prize by proving that a clean analytic solution was unsolvable. There are essentially more degrees of freedom than there are conserved quantities. So this means that when astronomers like myself want to calculate the orbits of multi-planet systems or circumbinary planet systems, anything involving at least three or more particles, we have to do all of these numerical simulations. In these simulations, we essentially propagate or move the bodies along by small steps, calculate the resulting change in the gravitational fields that results, and then calculate the corresponding accelerations that would happen as a result of those gravitational fields. So this is a painstaking and computationally expensive process. In 1999, Holman and Weigert wrote a superb research paper where they simulated many thousands of possible orbits for a single planet orbiting a binary star. And in each of these simulations, the authors asked a simple question. After many thousands of years of simulating these orbits, was the planet at the end of the day stable and more or less in the same type of orbit, or did it end up crashed into the planet or ejected from the star system as a result of the gravitational torque by the binary star system? So for example, you can see the overlaid path of a stable planet here after many orbits around the orange and red stars comprising the binary. Now the orbit does move around a little, but it doesn't end up crashing into anything or flying out of the system. By moving the planet just a little bit closer to the binary at the start of the simulation, the planetary orbit 
becomes excited and eventually gets ejected altogether from the system. Now, after running thousands of different configurations, Holman and Weiger realized that there existed a critical distance at which the planetary orbit was stable or unstable. So pass interior to this critical distance and the planet's fate was perilous. It would likely be ejected from the system. But stay outside this line and you'd be safe. The planet should survive for maybe billions of years. Now this critical distance isn't just a universal number for all star systems, it depends on both the orbital eccentricity of the binary and also the mass ratio between the two stars in the binary. So it's a multi-dimensional quantity that we're looking at here. To figure out this dividing line, they essentially just took the battery of simulations and drew a line through the dividing boundary from the stable simulations shown here in black and the unstable simulations which are shown here in white. So this cyan line seems to roughly trace out the critical boundary. I should also add here that the mass ratio of the binary has been fixed so that we can more easily visualize the trends. That paper was a major breakthrough, evidenced by the fact it's been cited over 500 times, which trust me, that's a lot. We use this law all the time to get a sense as to how perilous the orbits of newly discovered circumbinary planets are. And remarkably, many of the circumbinary planets discovered by Kepler, at least, seem to live rather close to this line of critical stability. But let's look at the plot again. Okay, the cyan line does a decent job, but clearly there is structure here which is not captured by this simple model. Islands of instability appear at specific points, which occur around the locations where the planet and the binary would be in what we would call a mean motion resonance. So you might remember Chris Lamb from an earlier video on this channel, and Chris had been applying neural networks to problems in exoplanetary science. So you can guess where this is going. We kind of naturally wondered whether a neural network could perhaps capture these islands of instability and do a better job of predicting whether a circumbinary planet is stable or unstable. So technically the problem we're considering here would be called a supervised learning problem. And whenever you have that kind of problem, you first need to generate the training set. So these are examples that the machine will look at where it knows what the answer is. And hopefully by looking at many, many of these examples, it will be able to learn what the patterns are in the data. So the first step then for us was to use a numerical simulator to simulate the orbits of many thousands of different possible configurations for the binary star and the planet around that binary star. Altogether, we ran 10 million simulations where we varied the mass ratio of the binary, the eccentricity of the binary, and how far away the planet was away from the binary. And in each of those simulations, we propagated the motion of the planet for 10,000 planetary orbits, where the time step was set to be less than one-tenth of a planetary orbit. So Altogether, there was over a trillion calculations in this work. Chris then coded up a deep neural network, which took this training set as an input. We actually held some of it aside as a holdout testing data set. And ultimately, after much fitting and regressing of the architecture of this deep network, we were finally able to capture these islands of instability that I showed you before. So this means that our deep neural network is able to outperform the accuracy of the simple cyan line that I showed you as produced by Holman and Weigert. So obviously back in 1999, deep neural networks weren't really a thing. That's probably why they weren't used. But hopefully this tool here is enabling the community to make more accurate predictions in the future. Now, as we all know, machine learning is becoming increasingly common in our lives from facial recognition on Facebook to self-driving cars. What's important to stress is that a lot of the software which has been developed for these applications, so for instance, Google's TensorFlow, have been made publicly available for anyone to use, including research scientists. And that's a non-trivial point because there were millions, if not billions of dollars of investment poured into these tools which are now available to us. So as research scientists, clearly there's an opportunity here to use these very advanced and sophisticated tools that would require many, many PhDs worth of research to get to the same level with. But I think the hardest thing with machine learning and research is just thinking of a good idea of thinking about cases where machine learning could 
really make a difference and really improve things more than traditional methods. I'm sure part of that problem is just because we're not used to thinking about machine learning, but with people growing up now with machine learning all around them, I think as a community, we'll probably get better at this as time goes on. So by now, Chris has actually published two papers with me on using neural networks to make predictions for exoplanetary science. And I think predictions is one of those areas where machine learning and deep neural networks are really powerful. So maybe we'll see more applications like that in the future. Just to update you, after Chris finished his degree here at Columbia University, he left to work in DC um, so he's not in academia right now. He's actually deciding what he might do in the future. I think he definitely enjoyed the experience of doing research. Um, I really enjoyed working with him. So uh, who knows, maybe he'll be back here in the Cool Words Lab or somewhere else in the future. In any case, I'm optimistic about the future possibilities of machine learning helping us to answer research questions. But it's important to stress that it won't answer every question. It is a tool which is very powerful in certain applications, and I think prediction is one of them, but it's not a tool for every problem. So let us know if you have any good ideas for what you think machine learning could help with exoplanetary science, or if you have any questions about the paper that we wrote together. I'm gonna to put a link down below for the archive link of the paper so you can check it out if you're interested. As always, thank you for watching this video, everybody. And of course, if you haven't subscribed and you'd like hearing about real research in exoplanetary science, make sure you click the subscribe button down below. Um, until the next video, everybody, stay thoughtful and stay curious.